All right. Uh, good afternoon. You will have seen uh, the Secretary General's tweet uh, yesterday, or rather on Saturday night, uh, following the, um, the attack on the synagogue in California. And I have a further statement to make on hate-based violence, and it reads as follows. Around the world, we are seeing a disturbing groundswell of intolerance and hate-based violence targeting worshipers of many faiths. In recent days, a synagogue in the United States and a church in Burkina Faso have come under attack. Such incidents have become all too familiar. Muslims gunned down in mosques, their religious sites vandalized, Jews murdered in synagogues, their gravestones defaced with swastikas, Christians killed at prayers, and their churches often torched. Houses of worship, instead of the safe havens they should be, have become targets. Beyond the murders, there is a loathsome rhetoric, xenophobia aimed not only at religious groups, but also at migrants, minorities, and refugees, assertions of white supremacy, a resurgence of Nazi ideology, venom directed at anyone considered the other. Parts of the internet are becoming hot houses of hate, as like-minded bigots find each other online and platforms serve to inflame and enable hate to go viral. As crime feeds on crime, as vile views move from the fringes to the mainstream, the Secretary General is profoundly concerned that we are nearing a pivotal moment in battling hatred and extremism. That is why the Secretary General has set in motion two urgent initiatives, devising a plan of action to fully mobilize the United Nations system's response to tackling hate speech, led by his Special Representative on Genocide Prevention, Adama Dieng, and exploring how the United Nations can contribute to ensuring the safety of religious sanctuaries, an effort being led by his High Representative for the Alliance of Civilization, Angel Miguel Moratinos. The world must step out, excuse me, the world must step up to stamp out anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, persecution of Christians, and all forms of racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and incitement. Hatred is a threat to everyone, so it is a job for everyone. Political leaders and religious leaders have a special responsibility to promote peaceful coexistence. The Secretary General will count on the strong support of governments, civil society, and other partners in working together to uphold the values that bind us to a single human family. And that statement in the Secretary General's name is being issued as we speak. Uh, as you know, the Secretary General returned from Beijing, China, late Saturday evening. Before leaving China, he took part in the leaders' roundtable sessions on parts of the Belt and Road Forum. As he delivered the keynote uh, speech of the session on the topic of promoting green and sustainable development to implement the 2030 agenda, he noted addressing the deepening climate crisis uh, action is excuse me. He noted that addressing the deepening climate crisis requires action that is rooted in resolutions and that are sustainable and aligned with the Paris Agreement and the 2030 agenda. The Secretary General stressed that the green economy is the future as it fosters prosperity, creates a decent work, addresses root causes of conflict, and contributes to the full enjoyment of all human rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. Uh, back here, Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Political and Peace Building Affairs, told the Security Council this morning that the continuing absence of a political solution to the broader Israeli-Palestinian conflict undermines and compounds our efforts. She said the United Nations has repeatedly warned that the conflict cannot be managed in perpetuity. The status quo will only lead to further deterioration of the situation, radicalization of all sides, more suffering and conflict. Under Secretary General Di Carlo urged a renewed focus on the prospect of a two peaceful and secure states living side by side in harmony, adding that only determined action by the parties themselves can salvage the two state solution. She also welcomed the NGO Eco Peace for, <coughs> for joining the S Security Council debate, noting that their commendable efforts to promote Israeli Palestinian Jordanian collaboration around shared environmental challenges is exemplary. Turning to Libya, the UN mission in that country is concerned that access to food is becoming a greater challenge for civilians, refugees, and migrants in conflict areas of the capital, Tripoli. We continue to call for unconditional access for all humanitarian partners to respond to the urgent needs of conflict-affected population. We're also gravely concerned about the new reports of indiscriminate shelling of residential areas and airstrikes affecting the civilian population. 
We remind all parties of the imperative of protecting all civilians and calls on, we call on Libyan authorities to uphold protection of civilians and human rights. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that shelling and airstrikes, including on residential areas, continued over the weekend. One child was killed and three children were injured uh, in airstrikes over the past three days. That's according to our health sector partners. Overall, 96 civilian casualties, including 22 fatalities, have been verified since the start of the hostilities. An unknown number of civilians remain trapped in their homes by frontline fighting, including the urban refugees and migrants with access to food is becoming an increasing challenge. Our colleagues report that over 42,000 people are now being, have now been displaced as a result of the fighting. The UN and our humanitarian partners continue to remind all parties of the obligations under international humanitarian law to take all feasible measures to avoid civilian harm and to call on all parties to avoid ex using explosive weapons in populated areas given the likely indiscriminate effect. Turning to Southern Africa, at least five fatalities have been reported in Mozambique and more than 18,000 people have been displaced and are sheltering in accommodation centers as a result of Cyclone Kenneth, which made landfall in the country late last week. At least 33, excuse me, 3,380 houses have been destroyed. Schools and health facilities have also been damaged. That's according to our humanitarian colleagues. In the Comoros, uh, more than 41,000 people have been affected, while four people lost their lives and 182 suffered injuries related to the cyclone. The UN's humanitarian chief, Mark Lokok, yesterday unlocked $13 million from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund to provide life-saving food, shelter, health, water, and sanitation assistance to people impacted uh, both in the Comoros and Mozambique. The UN and, the part and our partners are continuing to support the government-led humanitarian response uh, to both uh, Kenneth and Cyclone Edai. And as you will see in a statement yesterday, the Secretary General extended his condolences and solidarity to the families of the victims and the government and people of Mozambique and the Comoros. Uh, Pramila Patton, the Secretary General Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, today commended the Security Council for adopting Resolution 2467 on conflict-related sexual violence. She said the resolution represents a powerful new instrument in the fight to eradicate this heinous crime, significantly strengthening the prevention through justice and accountability, and affirming for the first time that a survivor-centered approach must guide every aspect of the response of affected countries and the international community. Critically, she said, Resolution 2467 affirms that a survivor-centered approach is required to address conflict-related sexual violence in all UN peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding initiatives, including in the context of security and justice sector reform efforts, as well as negotiating of peace agreements and ceasefire verification mechanisms. The full press release is available. And earlier today, the Secretary General received a report compiled by uh, UN international agencies and experts today on, uh, excuse me, uh, demanding global, excuse me, demanding immediate, coordinated, and ambitious action to avert a potential disastrous drug resistance crisis. The UN ad hoc interagency coordination group on antimicrobial resistance released their report today in which it says that drug resistant diseases could cause 10 million deaths each year by 2050. Currently, at least uh, 700,000 people die each year due to drug-resistant diseases. The world is already feeling the economic and health consequences as crucial medicines become ineffective. The report recommends a prioritizing national ac action plans, stronger regulatory systems, investments in research, and urgently phasing out of use of critically important antimicrobial as growth promoters in agriculture. More information on the World Health Organization's website. And speaking of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, the, the Director General of WHO, is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He was in Butembo in North Kivu on Sunday, where one of the areas affected by the Ebola outbreak. He met personnel involved in the response, and you will recall that on the 19th of this month, Dr. Richard Valeri Muzuko uh, Kibung, an epidemiologist deployed with WHO, died during an attack on a, hosp on a hospital in Butembo. Dr. Tedros said on Twitter that he was moved to meet brave colleagues who have remained strong after their colleagues' death. Uh, 
He reaffirmed that WHO will not be intimidated and will finish the job, adding that engaging and working with communities is vital to fighting Ebola in the DRC. He warned that uh, Ebola outbreak will only be contained if the response is allowed to take place without violence. WHO remains re committed to supporting the Ministry of Health to end the outbreak as soon as possible. And from uh, Venezuela, or rather Colombia, UNICEF said today that more than 300,000 Venezuelan children need humanitarian assistance, including health, edu uh, education, and protection services. The agency says that while Colombia has been very generous in welcoming its neighbors, the international community should step up support as many Venezuelans are living in vulnerable host communities without overstretched resources. UNICEF is seeking um, is seeking to increase its current response budget from $5.7 million to $29 million. This will help, among others, to vaccinate more than 30,000 children and provide water. And today, the UN resident coordinator in Iran, Ugochi Daniels, presented the Iran flood response plan to the donor community in Tehran in a meeting hosted and co-chaired by the Iranian government. The plan seeks $25 million to cover the emergency and early recovery needs of 115,000 highly vulnerable people in the most hard-hit provinces of Golestan, Khuzestan, Ilam, and Loristan. Uh, the UN has allocated $2 million from the Central Emergency Fund uh, to respond to the urgent uh, needs. Tomorrow, a couple of things to flag. 12.30 p.m., there will be a briefing here uh, on the upcoming Play It Out concert to beat plastic pollution, which will be held in Antigua on June 1st. Uh, and um, Monica will tell you more about that because it's about the PGA, so I don't want to steal her uh, thunder. And uh, also tomorrow, the UN uh, Fund for Population, UNFPA, will hold its 15th Rafael Salas Memorial Lecture in the Ecosoc Chamber. That's at 10 a.m., this year's lecture will be delivered by Margot Wallström, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden and a former colleague of ours. The event seeks to honor the memory of UNFPA's first executive director and the important contribution he made. And this is leading up to their anniversary celebrations. Two more member states. Uh, we say thank you to Bosnia and Herzegovina and Colombia for paying their budget dues in full, which brings us up to... No? Is there another trial? Oh, you're pathetic. Uh, 88. 15? Come on. Uh, all right. You were the closest. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, with regard to the Secretary General uh, statement on hate-based uh, violence, uh, he mentioned that uh, those with uh, extreme uh, views and ideology find themselves uh, on the Internet. Uh, does he refer to uh, specific uh, social media platforms, or is he referring to the dark web? No, I, I mean, I, I think uh, you don't need to go uh, deep into the dark web to find um, hate. Uh, it is found on, uh, on many social media platforms, and I don't think there is one that has not been uh, touched uh, uh, by this type of heinous language. Carol. Stefan, on Friday you mentioned that you might have more to say today about the Secretary General's talks with President Xi in China and whether or not the plight of the Uyghurs was raised during sure. those conversations. I think as, as we've been saying, the, the, the Secretary General discussed uh, all relevant issues with the Chinese authorities. He did just that, and that includes the situation in Xinjiang. And this follows uh, several other contacts in the recent past on this same issue that he's had with Chinese uh, authorities. The Secretary General's position on this has always been the same in private as it is in public, and those are based on three indivisible principles. One, the full respect for the unity and territorial integrity of China. Condemnation of terrorist attacks as no cause or grievance can justify them. And that human rights must be fully respected in the fight against terrorism and in the prevention of violent extremism. Each community must feel that its identity is respected and that it fully belongs to the nation as a whole. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Carol. Well, basically, did was the message? Uh, what was the message on the uh, re-education re detention camps? Should they be shut down? Was there a discussion about uh, Michelle Bachelet and her multiple requests to 
be able to visit I the mean, region. What, what, the, what the Secretary General told his Chinese interlocutors is that he fully stands by the initiatives of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights, on Michel Bachelet. His message was exactly that, the three points I made, that you know, uh, human rights must be fully respected in the fight against terrorism and the prevention of violent extremism, that each community must feel as its identity is respected and that it fully belongs to the nation as a whole. He made three points, uh, which he's made in public, and he's made them in private as well. Michelle. Was he satisfied by the response he got from the Chinese? I think I'll, I'm not going to... It's not for me to speak uh, on behalf of the Chinese authorities. This is part of a dialogue uh, that the Secretary General has had with Chinese authorities in the past and that he will continue to have. But I'm not asking what the Chinese said. I'm asking, was he satisfied? Yes, I think I've answered the, the question. Uh, Pam. Uh, thanks, Stefan. The, all of the discussions this morning on the... I mean, I would add there was a very cordial... Uh, it was a very cordial discussion uh, that they had. And Frank. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the discussion, Stefan, this morning on the universal health coverage will be um, highlighted in September. Will the Secretary General play any role in this, and what role will he play when it comes up during UNGA? Thank you. Uh, the issue of universal health, co uh, health coverage is one that the Secretary General strongly supports. He participated, uh, I think, not too long ago in a meeting on Tokyo on this, and this is uh, part and parcel of the uh, the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, that's I, I'll get you a bit more information. Yeah. Stephen, what's your comment on the uh, statement of the Israeli ambassador? Uh, I mean, the part where he uh, was. Um, that were related to some facts, uh, that his government is basically not committed to the UN resolution and does not see settlements as illegal uh, and uh, see settlements as part of the Israeli territories. I, I haven't, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't mean, have did. a chance. I, I don't, I trust what you're telling me. I didn't see the, the statement, but regardless, the Secretary General's position uh, remains unchanged, and it's reflected in what Ms. Uh, DiCarlo said on the, the need for the parties to engage for a two-state uh, solution. Um, the Secretary General's views on, uh, on the settlements remain unchanged. They're based on, on UN resolutions, and our, our position is unchanged, and our message will be unchanged. Regard, are you going to? Is there? Um, there was supposed to be a list that published regarding uh, settlements and um, trade uh, and settlements. Yeah, this is something that the High Commissioner for Human Rights has been tasked to do by the High, uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, I don't have a calendar on on when that will come out, but you could check with our human rights colleagues, Carol. Moving on to Libya, can mm -hmm. you update us on what Ghassan uh, Salame is up to? Um, the last we heard, he had meetings in Paris, mm -hmm. and then he was moving on from there, and he's trying to get a ceasefire going before the start of Ramadan. Uh, where do things stand? Uh, things stand, unfortunately, that the parties, uh, the, the fighting is continuing. Uh, we're seeing the violence uh, in, uh, in Tripoli, we're seeing the lives of civilians put at risk. Uh, we're seeing the indiscriminate use of, uh, of heavy artillery. Mr. Salame is continuing his contacts, uh, both uh, locally and internationally, in trying to achieve a cessation of, of hostilities. Monica, great. Uh, you had another question. Well, do you still have it? I do. Uh, then let's go. Western Sahara. Yep. There's a vote tomorrow at the Security uh -huh. Council on Minurso. Uh, can you update us on what um, the Special Envoy Kohler is doing? Are the preparations for the third round um, moving ahead? What can you tell us? I don't. Uh, I will uh, honestly. I, uh, there are a lot of issues. I try not to speak on, off the top of my head. Western Sahara is one. Uh, I, that I can do. Okay, thank you.